We're going to dive into magnetism. Chapter 24 is all about magnetic fields and forces. And I love talking about magnetic fields and forces because they're so surprising. And those are the aspects of physics that I just love learning about and talking about are those areas of life where reality and our common sense are somewhat in conflict. Uh, and, and so I think that magnetism is one of the first places where we run into that. So magnetic forces. Well, what can we say about magnetic forces? Well, first of all, it is a long range force. It is not a contact force. Second of all, it can be attractive or repulsive. Whoa. So that's pretty interesting. Um, you've all probably seen magnets before. Let's just dive into it. This picture shows a MRI of a dolphin. An MRI, MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And so what an MRI does is it uses a magnetic field to probe the nuclei of the atoms inside a dolphin. Basically, an MRI can tell exactly where hydrogen nuclei are inside of a dolphin. And since scientists know the water content of various parts of our bodies, by knowing where the hydrogen atoms are, we know where the water is. And we can reconstruct a very sharp three-dimensional image of the inside of an animal using these magnetic probe fields. It's kind of a crazy thing. We'll talk just a tiny bit about that a little bit later on in the chapter. A compass is just a magnetic dipole. Remember that an electric dipole is a positive and a negative charge hanging out next to each other. A magnetic dipole is a north and a south pole hanging out next to each other. And a compass is simply a magnetic dipole. And so it can be used to line up with some external magnetic field. Now, we're probably most familiar with what we call permanent magnets, like this, what I was showing just a moment ago. But electric currents can also produce magnetic fields. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Here's a picture of the aurora. This is a pretty cool phenomenon created by magnetic fields and forces. It turns out that this is... Uh, caused by charged particles that are streaming in from outer space, so-called cosmic rays, and nobody's quite sure where all of those come from. Uh, these charged particles are streaming in towards uh, the, the Earth, and the Earth's magnetic field causes those, to, causes those charged particles to spiral around the magnetic field lines, which tends to funnel them to the poles. And so these charged particles move to the poles. As they do so, they interact with the particles of our atmosphere, having collisions. And as they do so, their energy is released. And we can see that in the form of the aurora. The Earth's magnetic field helps protect us from those charged particles. Those charged particles get funneled to the poles instead of streaming down and hitting the Earth, which is what they would do if there was no magnetic field. So that's kind of cool. One of several reasons why you would be exposed to a lot more radiation if you were living on Mars than if you were living on the Earth, which I'm assuming you are at present. Um, we're going to learn how to draw magnetic field lines. Uh, we're pretty good at drawing electric field lines. We'll see that they're very, very similar. Um, here is a reminder picture of an electric dipole. We'll find that the magnetic fields for a magnetic dipole looks identical. So we're going to go through a series of experiments, and these experiments will mostly be experiments of the mind, um, since I am here in my basement and you are there wherever you are. Um, so one of the earliest experiments that humans did with magnets is you can take a magnet and you can tape it to a cork or some light floating object, and it will align itself with the Earth's magnetic field. And we call the end of the magnet that points geographically north we call that the north pole of the magnet. And we call the end that aligns itself with the geographic south the south pole of the magnet. Remember, it was Benjamin Franklin who established the convention of positive and negative charges. We don't know who established the convention of north and south pole because it's been with us since antiquity. We don't know who invented this idea of floating a magnet on a cork. 
but it has been around since the prehistory of humans. So, a magnet that is free to rotate like this, we call it a compass. Like, pels, like poles repel, and unlike poles attract. Okay, I already demonstrated that. Um, that's similar to the rules for electricity, isn't it? So we see that there are some real similarities here. There are also some real differences. Here's another uh, experiment. Cutting a bar magnet in half produces two weaker, but still complete magnets. So here I have these two magnets here, and they are repelling each other quite nicely. If I break one of these in half, do you think I'll have a north and a south pole? Oh. Okay, took me a couple tries. Here I did. I broke it. Look. Now I broke it. Do I have just a north or just a south? No, I have both. How can I tell? Because I get attraction here and repulsion there. So I still have attraction and repulsion. I still have two sides of a magnet, but now it's weaker and a little bit sharp, and I hope my kids don't step on the shards. Okay. Magnets can pick up some objects, such as paper clips, but not all objects. If an object is attracted to one end of a magnet, it will also be attracted to the other end of the magnet. Um, but a lot of things just are not magnetic. You know, so here's a magnet. This one's a little bit stronger. These are some what are called neodymium magnets, dimium magnets. And you can see that it picks up this nut quite nicely. However, how about this stuff? Ooh, there's a quarter. Nope. There's a penny. Nope. Here's an aluminum can. Nope. Hmm, that's interesting. Here's a nickel. Ooh. Nickel is magnetic. Apparently modern nickels are made of something other than nickel. Modern pennies, also not made of copper. Okay. What else? Uh, yeah, other stuff. Markers? Nope, nope. Plastic is not magnetic. Okay, lots of stuff is not magnetic. In fact, a handful, there's only a handful of things that are magnetic at room temperature. Iron, nickel, cobalt. Those are the three elements that are magnetic at room temperature. Charged rod brought, is brought near the magnet. There'll be a small polarization force, like we studied in chapter 21, as there would be on any other piece of metal uh, or any other conductor. But there is not a strong magnetic force, is what there is not. Okay, so what do these experiments tell us? Well, Magnetism is not the same as electricity, though there are some fundamental, deep and subtle connections between electricity and magnetism. They just are not the same. So, magnetism is a long-range force, I already mentioned that, so the magnets don't need to touch each other in order to experience that force. And so now we've learned about gravity, electricity is a long-range force, and we've also got magnetism now to add to the list. There are two others in the universe that we know of, and those are the weak force, the nuclear weak force, and the nuclear strong force. And those are um, responsible for holding the nucleus together and for holding protons and neutrons together. We're not going to get into those too much in this class. But that is all of the long-range forces that physicists are absolutely sure exist in the world. Magnets have two types of poles, a north and a south pole called magnetic dipoles, and they always come in pairs. And so this is the important point here. The basic unit of magnetism is a magnetic dipole. Nowhere in the universe will you find a north pole all by itself or a south pole all by itself. Those are called magnetic monopoles. They don't exist, which is really a little bit interesting. 
Um, the poles of a bar magnet can be identified by using a compass. And then other magnets can be identified by testing them against a bar magnet. So it's much like charges, right? In order to tell whether this charge I have is positive or negative, I need to bring it near a positive and a negative, and it will attract one and repel the other, right? So I, in order to know whether I have a positive or a negative charge, I need to have another charge that I know about nearby. Similarly, with magnets, you need to have a north and a south pole to test them with. So a pole that repels a known south pole and attracts a known north pole must be a south pole. And only certain materials are magnetic. Most common material is iron. So most of the stuff that is magnetic around us is magnetic because it's got a high iron content. Every magnet sets up a magnetic field in the space around it. And so, again, this sort of helps us with that action at a distance problem that we were talking about with electricity also, right? So if I have this stack of magnets here, and I've got this little washer, then the magnet can pick up the washer. That's probably not super surprising to everybody. But maybe a more interesting question is how in the world does the washer know the magnet is there? They're not touching. I can't pick up the washer without touching it. Look, I'm trying really hard. Okay. Well, we can say that the magnet sets up a magnetic field. It creates a magnetic field which permeates the space around it, and then the washer interacts with that field. Okay, that gets rid of this pesky action at a distance problem. So here we see an external magnetic field, and we see the compass needle interacting with that external magnetic field. Um, and in this case, it will align itself with the magnetic field. We typically use B to represent the magnetic field, since it has a magnitude and a direction, it is a vector. So here we see a simulation, and here I have a bar magnet here, and um, this bar magnet then is setting up a magnetic field all around the space around it. How can I tell it's there? Hmm. Kind of like the wind, you can only see its effect. So what we're going to do, we are going to add a compass to this situation, and then we can see the effect of the field on the compass. And here we see the compass at some angle, and notice if I move it, the angle of the compass changes. Oh, well, this compass must be aligning itself with the magnetic field due to this magnet right here. Um, so here's a convention. The red side of the compass is always our north side, and the white part of our compass is our south side. That's just a convention. Um, it is pretty standard. Um, notice then that the north side of my compass always wants to align with the south side of my magnet, and the south side of the compass wants to align with the north side of the magnet. Whether I move the magnet or the compass, it doesn't matter. I'm changing the magnetic field at the location of the compass, and it will arrange itself, or it will. there will be a torque on it until it lines up with the magnetic field. So we could imagine that we had a whole bunch of little tiny compasses all over here. Then that would tell us the direction of the magnetic field at that location. In this simulation, the brightness of the compass indicates the strength of the field. So here we see the Earth in the simulation, and the Earth acts like a great big magnet. And so if we were to get a compass, then we see that the north end of my compass, the red, points to the geographic north pole of the Earth. Ooh! Remember, these conventions were established eons ago. Darn it! Here's another weird thing. The North Pole of the North Geographic Pole of the Earth is the South Magnetic Pole of the Earth because opposites attract and our naming convention is that the side of a magnet that points geographically north is the North Pole of our compass. Yeah, that's a little weird. I have another slide on that in just a minute. Again, we could put little compasses everywhere, and we would see that they would align themselves with the magnetic field of the Earth. This is so interesting. 
the Earth acts like a bar magnet. And you know what's even cooler is no one really knows why. There is not a solid, uh, there's not a solid model that's accepted for the mechanism by which the Earth has a magnetic field. And not all planets do have a magnetic field. Mars, for example, has no magnetic field. It's very similar to Earth in many ways, yet it has no magnetic field, and the Earth has a very strong magnetic field. Who knows? The Sun has a really strong magnetic field. It flips directions every 11 years, and nobody has a clue why. Well, that's pretty cool. So we could use the, the compasses to probe uh, individual locations, um, but we can also suspend some oil, iron filings in oil or sprinkle them in the vicinity of a, of a magnet. And it will, th those iron filings, since iron is a magnetic material, those iron filings will align themselves with the external magnetic field. And so it actually, it's even a little bit easier to see the effect of a magnetic field than it is an electric field um, because of this technique with the iron filings. It works quite well. So we can visualize the magnetic field all around this bar magnet with these iron filings. And then the compasses at any point will be tangent to that magnetic field, right? So remember the magnetic field is a vector, which means it has a specific direction and a specific magnitude at any given location. The magnetic field lines just help us to visualize it. At any one point, the magnetic field will be tangent to the magnetic field line at that location. Here's a rule. The magnetic field of a magnet outside the magnet, that is an important caveat, points away from the North Pole and towards the South Pole. Away from the North Pole and towards the South Pole. And that's outside a magnet. We have to remember that. Um, a mnemonic, which may help you or not, is that these are in alphabetical order. So N comes before S, and outside a magnet, the field points from N to S. The, uh, if we were to have a whole bunch of compasses and kind of spread it around the magnet, we could see this. So the compass tells us the direction of the field at any one point, at any one point. Um, and in order to see what the, have a sense for the entire field, then we would have to connect all of those lines so that these were tangent to the magnetic field lines, and we'd get a shape that looked an awful lot. Okay, let's practice really quick. Um, a compass needle is placed at the back black dot. What direction will the compass point? Uh, why don't you give that some thought and I'll see you on the other side. Remember the red end of the compass is the north. Okay, well here we see opposites attract, likes repel. So the north side should point straight away. Now on this simulation, my south side is white and in the slide, the south side is a black, but the north side is the red side. So this is what we are looking for. PowerPoint agrees. Yay! Okay, how about this one? Now we're going to move the black dot up here. And so here's the correct orientation. The south pole of the compass tries to get as close as it can to the north pole of the magnet. The north pole of the compass gets as close as it can to the south pole of the magnet. And PowerPoint agrees. Oh, goody. So, the magnetic field lines of a bar magnet, I promised you that they would look very similar to the dipole, to an electric dipole, and indeed they do. So again, this is the magnetic field line. At any one point, the field, the magnetic field, is tangent to the field lines at that point. Much like with electric fields, where the field lines are closer together, we have a stronger field. And where the field lines are farther apart, we have a weak field. Every field leaves the North Pole and enters the South Pole. And so here is a picture of an actual magnet in some iron filings. And we do see this general shape. It's quite nice. Again, though, at any point, the magnetic field can only have one direction and one magnitude. So the magnetic field vector is always tangent to the magnetic field line. Uh, here's just a couple of, of other arrangements, a couple North Poles, 
next to each other. Again, we've got a heavy leaving the North Pole, and there's really nowhere for it to go here. They kind of get pushed out. We see that right in between there, we get a field of zero. That seems reasonable. Uh, here we see a North and a South Pole, so a field line can leave the North Pole of one magnet and enter the South Pole of another magnet. Just various arrangements. There's an infinite number of these we could show, uh, but here's just a couple. A refrigerator magnet looks like this. Um, this is an arrangement of magnets that actually it tends to concentrate the magnetic field on one side of the magnet. And so we have a much stronger magnetic field on one side than the other. And these alternating fields ensure that two refrigerator magnets will always stick to each other, which is kind of interesting. I do this as a demo a lot of times, but I can't really do that. Uh, I don't have, I can't pass around a couple refrigerator magnets, but if you have a couple refrigerator magnets, stick them back to back so that they stick real good, and then slide them with respect to each other, and you'll feel a as they go from repulsion, attraction, repulsion, attraction, repulsion, attraction, as these field lines overlap. So that's kind of a nice, you can really, if you take two refrigerator magnets and you pull them apart, you'll be able to feel this. Okay, here's a quick picture of the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, again, the south pole of the Earth's magnet is located near the north geographic pole. That's a tricky one to remember. Uh, and again, it has to do with the historical naming convention. So this is why the north pole of a compass points geographically north. Now, it turns out that the, the north geographic pole and the south magnetic pole are not coincident. They're not at the exact same location. The south magnetic pole is actually under the surface of the Earth somewhere, um, and it's actually off just a little bit. And this angle between the geographic pole and the magnetic pole, it actually varies. Um, it's not a constant thing because the Earth's magnetic pole moves a little bit. Oh, that's weird. There's, uh, in fact, about something like 11,000 years ago, it completely switched directions. Again, nobody really knows why, because nobody really knows the origin of the Earth's magnetic field. Super cool. So notice, then, if we look at the magnetic field lines here, there's only really one place, one ring, I guess, around the Earth here, where the magnetic field is truly horizontal with the Earth's surface. Everywhere else, it forms a little bit of an angle. And so notice here in the northern hemisphere, um, the field lines dip in here as they're going into the south pole. And here in the southern hemisphere, as they're exiting the north pole, um, they also are not parallel to the Earth's surface. We call that the dip angle. So here we're looking at some region of the northern hemisphere, and the north pole of the compass actually will dip below horizontal ever so slightly. That's kind of cool.